think that many of the current fashionable half guard moves may be very vulnerable to knee bars and kimura locks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in a real fight, a half guard is a weak position. Back in the middle, yeah. you very easily in half guard. So these are two aspects of the jiu which I don't really place great emphasis on. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you, you saw all kind of techniques? Uh, is you have sometimes feeling that uh, you can see something new? Like, oh, the, new yeah. emerging all the, time. the most important thing is not so much that there are new techniques as there are new fashions. The fashions? You did things like fashion. Um, every year something new comes in. Everyone has a different body type. And for every given body type there are a set of techniques which work best. When a new world champion emerges and he emphasizes certain moves, everyone follows the fashion. So it's Marcel Garcia, Marcel Garcia. There are other people too, um, but Garcia is a, a notable example. Um, and so it's not so much that new techniques emerge as new fashion mm -hmm. emerge. And these are determined by people whose body type meant that they had to use a certain set of moves and they were very successful with them. As a result, other people follow those trends. And so, who knows, five years from now, the techniques which are currently in fashion will be very different. Um, these things, just like fashion, are in so 10 years from now, maybe the same techniques which Marcelo Garcia made popular today will be used again by someone else. Uh, but five years from now, they'll be unpopular. Who knows? They go in cycles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. How you can recognize good uh, jiu-jitsu fighter? Like I know, but but it, you look at body type, the flexibility, heart. There are certain attributes which are very important. Um, fighting spirit is important. The uh, quality of uh, never giving up, uh, unless of course it's absolutely necessary. Uh, flexibility is very very useful in jiu-jitsu. Endurance is perhaps the most important. Many people are strong, but not many people are strong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is the more important thing. It's not so much to be strong at the start of the match, but to be strong at the finish of the match. That's the most important. Um, I also believe that intelligence is very, very important to be a successful fighter. Now, when I say intelligence, I don't mean um, to be someone who has a high IQ. Some people can have a very low IQ, but be intelligent in the way that matters in jiu-jitsu. There are different forms of intelligence. Some people are thinkers and so far as they, that they reason about problems in general. So other people grasp concepts intuitively, but they're both intelligent in different ways. So don't misunderstand me on that. Just because someone uh, uh, can't articulate their views doesn't mean they're not intelligent. Uh, uh, but I do believe that the ability to think about the sport and understand what's going on when you're trying to engage in it is one of the most important factors in becoming a successful student. Whether or not you can articulate this to other people, that's not always the case. But at some level, there has to be deep thinking about what you're doing and understanding on some kind of intellectual level uh, as to what you're doing for the person. So, also, it's, uh, I have this feeling uh, it's, it's the most involve your brain as uh, very much because there's so many techniques dif it's different uh, than judo different than boxing yeah. i think in many sports such as boxing and judo there there has to be a kind of natural talent you have to be able to have a sense of timing and commitment to a move the actual speed attributes that you're born with rather than develop Whereas in Jiu-Jitsu, because the game is generally very slow, it's much more cerebral thinking and reasoning about what's going on as you, as you engage in the sport. Um, to be a Judo World Champion, I think you need to have certain attributes. And if you don't have them, you'll never be a World Champion. Uh, same thing in boxing. If your body type is the wrong type in boxing, if, you're, if your face is easily broken and you bleed easily, you're never going to be a boxing champion. But in Jiu-Jitsu, if you're prepared to think and commit yourself to hard work, anyone can get you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, next question is uh, where Jiu Jitsu is going as a martial art? Uh, 
if uh, the technique is still developed, you said about like fa fashion up, but uh, this fashion makes also technique better on one technique, they develop new, new stuff. I do, I do think that the technical level in Jiu Jitsu will improve as more people engage in the sport. Anytime you have a greater number of people involved in the sport, you're going to have more minds and better minds engaged in the, the pursuit of, of, of that in the sport and the sport itself is going to rise up in response. In the early days of science, for example, there were very few people engaged in it, just a few wealthy people in, in Europe. And as a result, science didn't make much progress. But as soon as science went into the middle classes, where huge numbers of people became engaged in, in, in the industry of science, so did scientific development increase much more rapidly. It's because more people were doing it. Anytime you have more people, you have brighter people, you have more industrious people, and just the sheer number of people involved uh, get greater results. So to you get some more people do this sport, this result can get better athletes, you're going to get uh, a wider cross section of people involved, and so people from different, uh, different perspectives, different cultures. As a result, you'll see much faster and better progress. Mm -hmm. You you think uh, so? You treat this like a science. A yes. little bit. I mean, both of them are problem solving. Science is problem solving about the nature of the, of the world around us. Jiu Jitsu is problem solving about combat between two people. And how do you think uh, Jiu Jitsu is going to grow? It's, uh, it's, uh, there is any chance to go for the Olympic Games or it's going to be something on the side? Um, because there's more people uh, doing this since. Yes, uh, I mean, the, the Olympics is uh, interesting. Quote. The only thing is that there are already two sports which are very similar to already the Olympics, wrestling and judo. So the Olympic Committee may be... But also they, they focus more on stand-up uh, right yeah, now. This is true, this is true. Um, I can't speak for the Olympic Committee, of course. Uh, they have let some sports into the Olympic Games, which I never believed they would. So mm -hmm. you can't rule really out the Olympics in certain I mean, they can bring in anything. Um, I believe it would be good for the sport if they did bring it in. Um, there would have to be certain changes in the game though. They would have to figure out the problem of scoring, how they can stop it from scoring really busy, which is currently a very big problem in the sport. Um, there would have to be standardized rules for everyone to agrees on. But these are problems that can be overcome. Mm -hmm. And that would be wonderful if they be coming on this sport. So you think there's a chance? Okay. And <clears throat> Can you recommend start learning a uh, grand fight from uh, wearing gi first? You think it's good for... I for actually have um, uh, my own views on this. I believe when you first start learning gi, your very first weeks into this, you should train without it. Without the gi? Because at that point you're doing it more or less for self-defense. And of course the gi is not part of self-defense training. Um, so your very first lessons in gi Maybe your first month of it, so it should be without a key. So when you learn the absolute basics, it should just be in the context of self defense, okay. training without a key, shorts and a t shirt. As you actually get into the sport of the gear, I do believe the gear is a very useful element. It teaches you how to defend yourself better and it forces you to apply the techniques of the gear much more than without a key. You slip and slide and you straight to get out of bad positions. Um, Training with a gi is almost like training with ankle weights around the body. It's uncomfortable, it's tiring, but it makes your body stronger. Uh, it forces you to focus on certain aspects of the game which are very important, such as posture. It's much easier to break someone's posture down when they're wearing a gi. You have so many handles to grab. Um, and in this sense, it makes you stronger. So in the early days of your training, maybe the first five years, I think a large part of your game should be trained with the gi on. Maybe 60 to 70 mm -hmm. But there always has to be some no mm -hmm. You can't just have uh, uh, years at a time where you always train exclusively with a gi on. Otherwise, the moment you find someone who's not wearing a gi, you're going to feel lost and feel unsure of what you can grab and you're going to look sloppy as a result. As you get to a you're well engaged in the sport, uh, after say five years onwards, I think it should be 50 50. Uh, I will say this about gi training training with a gi makes your escapes much better. Because it's much harder to escape from someone's pins and submission holes when you're bound in the gi. But your offense is made better by training without the gi. It's harder to control another opponent if he's slipping and sliding out. 
So in summary, I would say training with gi develops your defensive skills better. Training without a gi develops your offensive skills mm -hmm. better. So you must be easy to work. Uh, but in the very early days, your first day of training, training without a gi, and then in your first one to four years in the sport, there should be a slight predominance in gi training. I heard also opinion that <clears throat> it's good to train the gi and then because then you need like something around two weeks just to uh, accommodate your technique to no. do gi. It's not true. No, you can't train exclusively with the gi on and then think that in two weeks you're going to be miraculous. Mm -hmm. uh, I no gi training, you'll never be as efficient as you do, as you would have been if you did both mm -hmm. uh, at all times in your training. Um, then two weeks, it's serious to take I mean like we be focus on gi game and then for example preparing yourself to uh, competition no gi and no, no. I think that no gi training has to be a regular part a regular, of okay. throughout your time as well. Okay. Um, uh, Shomi Williams uh, said me that <coughs> on his technique um, and he tried to uh, develop the technique he can use uh, both gi and no gi and I, I, I use uh, different technique gi and different technique no gi uh, and what do you recommend? If I don't think your game should change that much between gi and no gi otherwise you have to learn two different games mm -hmm. and if you learn two different games you have your training time between Gi training, no gi training. Um, ideally, what you want to do is have your game so similar in each case that every time you train, it will be equally effective for both sports. Mm -hmm. um, it would be sad to think that half of your training had no relevance to the other. They should both be, be relevant to each other. I try very hard to ensure that the techniques which I use in either gi or no gi cross over into the other. So that there's no there's very few times in my training where what I have what I what I do in no gi training has no relevance to my gi training and vice versa. Um, I think your game should know whether it be gi or no gi. So if if I like some technique uh, gi technique and I can use uh, this technique in no gi game, so should I just forget about this technique or depends how useful it is. There are certain things like collar strangles which are so useful without it, mm -hmm. uh, when you're wearing a gi that you, you need to learn all the collar strangles. And also collar strangles are useful because they teach you to control your clothes and uh, major positions which are directly relevant to no gi strangles, like sleep walls or ear teams or what have you. So there is a lot of crossover, you know, if you learn good collar strangles you will uh, develop the control to set up sleeper holes in a no gi scenario for example. Okay. Okay, this is done. And um, when to my ground skills game, uh, can I when I can put punches to my ground skills? I do think that there's danger if you start being punched in the face too early that you'll never learn to trust in the, the ground game. Um, just as you know, if I were a boxing coach and I had to see you someone to box, I would not have them spar on the very first day. I mean, simply not qualified, they may lose confidence and then they'll never be a good boxer, they're going to be afraid of being hit. Um, it's important not to break your students' confidence, they have to develop confidence over time. And if they're being constantly punched in the face, they're going to lose confidence in the ground game. So I do believe that you should be a very good blue or beginning boy you uh, mm -hmm. put on punch gloves and start getting punched in the face. Okay, and what about technique? Because when you can punch, you, um, the group of techniques you can use is less because uh, there's punches and some technique like half guard is uh, really hard to use. So if punches, if you put punches too early, for example there's boxer who's not afraid to get punched on his head but he wants to start uh, learning ground fight and punch. Uh, is, uh, those punches can destroy his techniques, he can uh, learn less. Then without punches? Uh, a lot of it depends on what the intentions of your student are. If their intention is to learn Bali Tudo, and that's all they're interested in, learn to become a submission grapple. Uh, if he comes from a boxing background, being punched in the face, then I would be willing to teach him much more early. Mm -hmm. uh, your Bali Tudo techniques. 
Um, but for the average student who has no background in the martial arts, I would mm -hmm. begin with dual grappling and training and then only in time bring in punching. But don't you think if the guy can just uh, just grab, just uh, do grappling, like no, no punches, he can be just better on the ground? Um, I don't know if you mean if the guy come and he has no experience on the ground and he starts striking on the ground, he's not going to learn so, much, so many depth. Yeah, I definitely believe that. Yeah, I believe he will have a weak ground game as a result. So if you want to just learn ground, you, sh you, should, you should forget about uh, uh, striking on the beginning until you get some skills, like you said, blue belt. Yeah, yeah. You I, I generally encourage you to get be a good blue belt before mm -hmm. they start going to Okay. And, uh, while you're teaching students, uh, what do you try to focus? What is the most important uh, point of your teaching? The most important thing is that they understand why a move works. Anyone can just show someone a move. But their understanding of Jiu-Jitsu will always be shallow unless they understand why the move works. When you understand why a move works, then uh, your, your overall grasping of the sport increases uh, in ways that most people don't understand. If I just show a move and the guy repeats it, he still has a childlike mentality. He's just following like a child. It's only when you understand the, you understand the mechanical principles underlying the move that you make true progress in the sport. So when I teach, it's always, here's a move, here's why it works. Okay. And um, do you have some secret techniques uh, for your student? No. I don't believe in the idea of trying to um, First of all, what makes a fighter is not so much knowing the secret techniques. To be honest, we live in an age of information, it's hard for them to really be in secret techniques. Um, what makes a fighter good is not having access to secret information, but by working harder than the other people around with the information that everyone has available. This is not for um, so I don't keep a secret question to me, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a funny question. People always think that secrets are the way to do it. There's no secrets. Because there was, uh, martial arts used to was like that, right? Um, so those days are uh, long gone. Yeah. Um, the secret of success is known to everyone. It's just hard work and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, now about MMA a little bit. Is today rules um, um, MMA rules like rounds, uh, a punch of, uh, you can punch from the back, uh, make uh, jiu-jitsu fighters less effective than it was before? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, the current rules in mixed martial arts are designed to make the sport more entertaining. Primary purpose of them to make people who have no understanding of the sport entertaining. Uh, as a result, they tend to play the knockout punches, um, lots of movement, no stalling. Uh, and uh, even an audience with a short attention span can, can watch. But yeah, it's true that they, they definitely do, uh, do not favor a pure jiu jitsu. Mm -hmm. um, so just long, boring fights until finally one man wins, they, those days are gone. Now people want entertainment. But um, so you think uh, jiu jitsu still is one of the most effective uh, fighting styles? You never win without knowing jiu jitsu. Yeah. But it's no longer enough to be just a mm -hmm. It was enough in the early days, yeah. but it, with the current rules, no way. You couldn't really just be repeated. So. Okay. Um, and now I would like to ask you about George St. Pierre, um, how he started training with you, and um, how was starting his fight, uh, what strategy you made for St. Pierre against BJ, and how was the whole background of this fight? Uh, George came down to train here and uh, he did some of the classes that I taught. Um, we trained together a couple of times and uh, he enjoyed the, the training a lot and asked me to be his grappling coach. So uh, I, I taught him what I thought would be the main uh, things needed to, to learn about fighting someone of the skills of BJ Penn. The problem with BJ is he's such a talented athlete in so many ways. He's extremely good boxer. He's very good as a wrestler and he's phenomenally good in Jiu Jitsu. His Jiu Jitsu is some of the best I've ever seen. Um, it's very, very hard to formulate a strategy against someone like this because he has no weaknesses. George went into the fight with two different strategies, you know, stand up punching duel 
with BJ, and the other was my strategy, which was to take BJ into a clinch against the fence, and uh, from there work his way into double leg takedowns. Um, George tried the first drag in round one, it did not work very well. BJ actually proved to be a very, very good boxer, and uh, inflicted a lot of damage on George. Uh, but George showed a lot of heart, and was able to switch strategies in the middle of a fight, which is not an easy thing to do, by the way. Um, he switched to the clinch strategy in round two and three, and had a lot of success with it. He was able to pin BJ against the fence to prevent him from swallowing, and work his way into double leg takedowns. Mm -hmm. but on the ground, he didn't really engage BJ too much, didn't want to go too far into BJ's ground skills, did just enough to, to win out a close decision. It was a very, very interesting fight. Yeah, it was. And uh, so what do you think, how, how it's going to be with the Matthews and what kind of strategy you you recommend to St. Pierre? I do think that BJ is the toughest fight in that weight division. I think BJ is easily so he's the He's challenge. the best yeah, BJ? In, in that weight division. And also, even in weight divisions above, I think BJ would be very dangerous. Um, with Hughes, it's a, a different fight entirely. Um, he has a completely different game from BJ. Um, I think that that is a fight to be won or lost in the spring. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it okay. before then. You asked before about secret techniques. Okay. There are no secret techniques, but there are secret strategies. Okay, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I think uh, like Pride is one of the is the is the has the best fighters right now. Pride the organization. Yeah, certainly in the heavyweight division. Yeah. And UFC don't doesn't have so many good names. Of course, there's Lee Del Couture, there's great great guys. But I think this weight category, category like BJ, uh, Saint Pierre, they're the best. Like yeah, that's the strongest in the UFC. And yeah. the Pride don't have so, so good guys yeah, in this it's category. Strange, uh, it's strange the way that worked out. Um, uh, for example, in the uh, welterweight and middleweight, uh, UFC is quite strong. For example, Paul Baroni didn't do very well in the middle weight in the UFC, but he's doing quite well in Pride. Um, but in heavyweight and lightweight, I think it's quite clear that the, uh, the UFC is a long way down. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what what you was feeling while you were standing uh, after after a match of BJ and St. Pierre in the octagon? Um, actually, it was uh, I was very proud of uh, George's effort. He fought a guy who I think is one of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. and um, was able to dominate him for two rounds. Uh, if he had used the clinching strategy in round one, it would have been three rounds. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a tremendous achievement uh, to fight someone at BJ's level and to, to dominate, uh, given that BJ really has no weaknesses and in many ways is a superior fighter to, to uh, St. Pierre. Um, so I was very proud of him in that respect. Um, when you're in there, you concentrate so much on the dynamics of the fight. Um, afterwards, I did a little slide somewhere around, <laughs> around the uh, stadium. It was an interesting crowd. Okay. And uh, the last question, I, I give you some names. I, I would like to, if you, if you can say a few, few words about those guys. Uh, Roger Gracie. Uh, Roger is the best guy in the world right now. He's um, uh, a phenomenal jiu-jitsu talent. Um, naturally gifted, has the heart of a lion, never quits, Get, gets into terrible situations in his fights, always fights his way out, never gives up, and always comes back and makes the other guy submit. He's the perfect example of control leading to submission. He controls his opponent and he makes him quit. Uh, he's very, very, very impressive. Uh, I've rolled many people in my life and, and he was <laughs> as good as it gets. Okay, and which, which of his fight you like the most? Um, any fight with him and Jack Array is good. Uh, those two guys, they have some battles. Uh, I will say that Jack Array does incredibly well uh, in the fights, but whenever Hodge actually gets a hold of him and locks him down, it's done. Like, Hodge is too good. Um, but if Jack Array can stay away, stay away, get a takedown, he can, he can do surprisingly well. Um, I would say the best fight I ever saw with Roger would be in the most recent Abu Dhabi against mm -hmm. Jacques Ray. That was a that was a pressure yeah. fight. 
and uh, it finished with a submission hold in an unusual position, a standing yeah. uh, sleeper hold. So there was a lot of excitement there. Uh, wh 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 where was the mistake of uh, Jacare in this fight? When he made mistakes? It's not so much that he made mistakes, Hodger forces you to make mistakes. Uh, Jacare did nothing wrong, uh, but Hodger is good on a level that most people don't really understand. Uh, I will say this about Hodger he is, I fully believe that he has a, a lot of potential to be even better. And I believe that three to four years from now, he will be many times better than he is even now. So, well, so I well, think that he will, even now, dominant. And five years from now, he'll be crushingly dominant. But what do you think? What what kind of aspect of his fight can can he improve? He will control people more from the beginning of the fight to the end. Right mm -hmm. now, he gets into trouble, mm -hmm. then turns it around and gets control. Very okay. soon, he will never get in trouble. So no more mistakes. Yeah, and then it's over. This machine. <laughs> a beat down. Okay. So the next question is about Jacare. What do you think about Amazing him? Amazing guy. Um, anyone, anyone that can survive against Hodger is impressive, uh, especially when he weighs less than Hodger. Um, Jacare is the set force in, in grappling today. Only Hodger surpasses him. Uh, an amazing athlete. Uh, people criticize him for not knowing much technique, but Gray knows enough technique to be effective, and mm -hmm. that's what counts. And he's very, very versatile, good in the standing position, good on the ground, good on top, good on bottom. Um, he never really gets himself into trouble, he's very smart in the way he fights. Um, he never puts himself in a position where he feels he's in danger. Um, and he finishes people. Yeah, he mm -hmm. controls them, he finishes them. So he can't be too technically weak. I mean, he's making the best, some of the best people in the world tap out. Um, mm -hmm. So he obviously knows more than people. Well, and next uh, big name is Marcelo Garcia. Very impressive guy. Um, you have to love a guy who is the smallest guy in the absolute weight division. He comes in and makes life hell for everybody. He threatens everyone. Um, what makes him so good? He's a guy who fully understood that certain techniques in Jiu-Jitsu are well matched to certain body types. And he only focused on the technique which is appropriate for his body type. He has a very unusual looking body. It's not normal looking. And every technique he's selected to focus upon is perfect for his body type. Um, that I believe is the, the basis of his success. Mm -hmm. What do you think about those names, Jorge, Jacare, and Mar Marcelo? Uh, how, how you can see them in MMA fights? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, none of them really has an extensive striking background. Um, Garcia's game in the standing position is not well suited to MMA at all, because he, he can't shoot on takedowns. Uh, his whole standing game is based on the arm drag, which is no use at all in a mixed martial arts fight. Um, Jacques Array, if he learned how to box, he'd be a formidable mixed martial arts fight. But I don't know if he has any background at all in striking, uh, so I can't comment on that. Um, Hodger has reach, which is very useful for a sniker, uh, and he is a very, very intelligent guy who learns very quickly. So I'm sure if he began striking training, he would become quite good at it quite quickly. Um, but only time will tell, because you can make all kinds of predictions, mm -hmm. but only when a man steps in the ring do you see how good they are. I think uh, Fabrizio Verdum is the example that really good uh, jiu-jitsu guy can he, I think he started becoming a good MMA fighter too. Yes. I think in one or two years he'll be much better. Mm -hmm. Still needs time. Yeah. Okay. My next question is about uh, Fedor Emelianenko. What do you think about this guy? Mm, very impressive. He's going to be hard to beat. Um, a guy to beat him will have to be someone who puts him on his back. That means he has to get through hard punches and be a very, very good wrestler to put him mm -hmm. on his back. And then he has to be able to control position. So he's got to be a, a complete fighter. He's got to be a good striker, a good takedown artist, and he's got to have good ground skills as well. Um, here's something for you. One person I think he beat him, Ricardo Arona. Arona? Yeah, I think that would be a bad matchup for Fedor. 
uh, uh, the runner will go through the punches to a takedown, and his judicial skill is good enough to control him on top. He's not going to get submitted by a third one. My prediction is if they have a four, I would put my money on a run. Yeah. This is but, one of the very few people in the world who I see is capable of being fatal. But that was like five years ago, and uh, yeah, I think a lot has changed since then. Yeah. So Arona has changed too. He's gotten better too. But also, Feather is a little bit heavier than Arona, no? A lot heavier. But uh, Arona is strong in ways that are uh, difficult to understand. He's mm -hmm. very, very strong. Um, this is one of the few people I see having a chance to be. Mm -hmm. uh, what about um, Verdum in one or two years? He can challenge Fedor? Yeah, his takedowns have to get a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. You think it's, there's no chance to catch Fedor on triangle or armbar? From, from oh, of course, there's always a chance, especially if you tire him out. But uh, the problem is it's very difficult because the whole time he's in your guard, he's throwing mm -hmm. huge punches at your face. It's hard to get the triangle there. Um, the best chance is to get to his back. Take away the danger of the striking. Mm -hmm. The guy who's good at getting to the bank. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you saw the, the the Polish guy, the Polish judo guy, uh, Pavel Nastula, and what do you think? I'm, I'm actually a big fan of uh, Pavel from judo. Uh -huh. I, I was a big fan of his. I, I loved his judo. I thought it was very very impressive. Um, he did very well. He fought one of the toughest guys in the world in his first. He looked pretty good for a while. He swept him over. He got him on his back. Um, but his Ground games are just a little high. Um, you know that he in Poland, the people, he was specialist on the ground. Yes. He was like famous yes. from the, his ground but skills. Ground skills in judo are not quite the same level as ground skills in jiu jitsu. Um, but he's great. Uh, I mean, he's one of the best judo players in modern era. Gold medals uh, in judo. Uh, but he needs to get more sophistication on the ground. Uh, he can do well, he's tough to finish, tough to put away, but he's not at a level to make the other guys have, and that's what needs to be done. So, if you can recommend something to him, you would say he should work more on his ground fight, or...? I would think he will take most people down, his judo skills are phenomenal, but he needs to work on his striking into a clinch, mm -hmm. and he needs to work on his ability to... Uh, uh, he needs to become more sophisticated on the ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how you commented the fight with Nogueira? You said this there was. Yeah, he's going to take a long. It's going to take a long time to get him to a position where he can beat Nogueira. Mm -hmm. because Nogueira has many years of defense, and uh, right now he knows too much. And you saw the fight with Alexander Yamalenko? Uh, no, 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 I did not see that. Yeah, uh, this would be an interesting fight. Okay. Um, okay, so I bring you. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Great. Thank